Okay, it's 6.45 now. So, I think we can get started. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Albert G. I'm one of the faculty members here at the Orthopedic uh, Surgery and Sports Medicine Department, uh, one of the vice chairs, and it's my honor to introduce Grand Rounds this morning. Um, as we always do before we do our Grand Rounds, we give our kudos to the uh, residents that have had positive feedback come through. And we have two kudos this morning. Uh, the first is for one of our uh, fourth year residents, Sean Purple. Uh, and this is actually from Dr. Madsen, one of our colleagues. Uh, Dr. Purple did an incredible job of shepherding the care of a patient of mine presented to clinic yesterday with rigors and an obvious shoulder infection. Thanks to Sean, less than 24 hours later, the patient is completely worked up and in the OR. Without his attention to every detail, we would not be here. Grateful to him. Grateful to have him on our team uh, from Rick. So, Sean, nice job uh, taking care of a, a patient who was in need there. And then our second uh, kudos is uh, for Ermius Kase, one of our second-year residents. Uh, this is from a patient who wrote in and said, I had the unfortunate experience of needing orthopedic care and ended up in the emergency department at Harborview Medical Center. The ED was busy and chaotic. It was amazing to hear from my ER room how caring the staff was to everyone. One person that stood out to me was the ortho resident, uh, Ermius uh, Kase. He examined me, helped facilitate getting the x-rays done, communicating what to expect while I waited for the OR, checking in during the wait to see if I needed additional pain meds, etc. I really appreciated knowing he was available during my time in the ED. And that was a grateful patient. So uh, a nice work, Ermius. Thanks for being a great resident. Okay. So those are the kudos for this morning. Now let's get started with our grand round stock. Um, we have um, the distinct pleasure of having uh, two of our uh, uh, members of our faculty here, um, Dr. Mia Hagen, one of our associate professors and sports medicine specialists in our department and one of our fourth year residents, Dr. J.D. Gatto, who uh, is one of, uh, like I said, was, is one of our residents. And this morning, they're gonna talk to us about uh, tears, or excuse me, from tear to repair, advances in meniscus management. Take it away, uh, J.D. or me, uh, J.D. or Dr. Or Dr. Hagen, who was gonna lead us off. Thank you, guys. Right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to October Grand Rounds, and thanks, Dr. G, for that introduction. Dr. Hagen and I will be speaking to you about meniscal tears and advancements and their current management. Unfortunately, I have yet to secure any disclosures. Today we'll be discussing why we should care about the meniscus and its injuries, biomechanics and anatomy of the menisci and how it relates to their function and dysfunction when they're injured, diagnosing these injuries, classifications and patterns, surgical and non-surgical management, novel treatments and therapies and augments to these techniques, as well as outcomes. So meniscal tears refer to the injury of the fibrocartilage crescent-shaped structures that are within the knee and their associated attachments. These attachments include the meniscocapsular attachments, meniscofemoral attachments, and the meniscal tibial roots. Uh, they can be traumatic in nature, uh, or they can be degenerative, or excuse me, or sometimes both. So why should we care about these little tiny structures in the knee? Well, meniscus injuries are relatively common with studies suggesting that the incidence of meniscal tears in the general population range somewhere between 61 to 65 uh, people per 100,000 people annually. And in populations that participate in high-risk sports, these are particularly important. It's estimated that the, uh, the estimated healthcare costs of about $4 billion annually for arthroscopic procedures uh, notably includes a large portion of these to be contributed to or contributed by uh, meniscal tears in their management. And risk factors for these injuries include BMI, age, and participation in high-risk sports, so soccer, basketball, skiing, football, all the fun ones. And these are often associated with pathologies of the knee, including ligament ruptures or fractures of the articular surface. So just like any concept in orthopedics, our fundamental understanding must begin with understanding the anatomy. 
So while the menisci are similar in their structure, there are some key differences. So the medial meniscus is wider and more C-shaped. That's due to the roots being further apart from each other. They're, the medial meniscus is typically less mobile uh, because it has attachments to the deep MCL. And it covers, it covers less of the articular surface, approximately 50% of the medial tibial plateau. And while the lateral meniscus covers more of the articular surface, so I'd say approximately 70% of the plateau. This is more circular and more mobile thanks to the popliteal hiatus and uh, lack of attachments in that region of the, near the capsule. And while they're different in many ways, they both are fibrocartilage and circumferential in design or near circumferential. And they have anterior and posterior roots to anchor them to the tibia, and they have the coronary ligaments to anchor them to the uh, tibia as well. Continuing with the anatomy of the meniscus, we have to first understand the vascular supply in order to understand how these injuries can heal. So perfusion of the meniscus comes from the superior, middle, and inferior geniculate arteries, and also nutrition for the meniscus comes from the synovial fluid that bathes these structures. The most Peripheral or external or radial zone, depending on what you like to call it, is uh, deemed the red-red zone uh, seen to the right of the image here on the screen. And this has good healing potential because of its vascular supply, supply whereas the more um, in, internal or uh, central portion of the meniscus is deemed the white-white zone. Um, and it is more flat as to fit underneath the femur, uh, but unfortunately less blood supply to that area, um, which can limit its healing abilities. Looking at the anatomy of the meniscus, they're, they are comprised primarily of collagen, proteoglycans, and water. And they, these fibers uh, are oriented in such a way that they translate axial load into circumferential stress over a larger cross-sectional area so as to distribute that force over a larger area. Looking closer at the biomechanics of the meniscus and its injuries, we first must understand the orientation of these fibers. There's various different orientations of these fibers with different biomechanical roles. We see here in this illustration the circumferential collagen uh, fibers that are attached to the roots and help with hoop, hoop stress dissipation of the axial load. There's also the radial fibers which help with the attachments of the meniscus to the surrounding structures. And then there's randomly oriented fibers uh, over the surface of the meniscus to help avoid shearing of uh, stress across the meniscus. I know everybody gets a little nervous when we start talking about physics, but it's key to orthopedics. When looking at force transduction over the meniscus, this illustration demonstrates the axial load of the femur on, onto the tibial plateau with the meniscus wedged in between and working to dissipate these forces across a larger cross-sectional area. The medial and lateral menisci transmit approximately 50 and 70% of the compartmental mechanical load, respectively, which correlates to the amount of surface of the tibial plateau that they cover. Um, the medial after medial meniscectomy or removal of part of this meniscus or surface area coverage of the tibial plateau, contract, contact stresses can increase 100%. And in the lateral compartment, this is even more so with contact stresses increasing to 200 to 350%. And in cadaveric studies where they've avulsed posterior horn of the medial meniscus, this increases the peak compartmental pressures. Uh, uh, and point loading of certain areas, oops, excuse me, uh, point loading of certain areas across the um, tibial plateau. And when that is repaired, it's restored to near normal anatomic function and pressures. So now that we've understand a little bit more about the anatomy, we have to know how to diagnose these injuries. So common presentations are pain localized around the knee joint line, swelling, which often occurs after activity or immediately after the injury or in slightly delayed fashion. Mechanical symptoms, so people describe locking or catching due to displaced uh, fragments. And joint instability, which some patients experience the sensation of the knee giving way. And reduced range of motion, so some folks will describe difficulty extending or bending the knee. Some of these seem a little bit vague, and sometimes these can often go overlooked or uh, misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed, which is why it's important to understand the meniscal pathology. Physical exam is the first clue. Uh, there are a number of provocative maneuvers, the most sensitive of which is just palpation across the joint line and tenderness with that palpation. Uh, next, we have the McMurray test seen in the illustration on the upper panel here. 
uh, whereas the uh, we're moving from flexion to extension with varus and external rotation or valgus and internal rotation, depending on the compartment that you're stressing. And then there's the aptly maneuver seen in the bottom right corner where the uh, patient is lying prone and the knee is brought to 90 degrees of flexion and uh, axial load is applied through the heel uh, in a twisting motion as well. And to Im imitate that while standing, the Thessaly test is while the patient is standing and is doing the uh, classic 1950s dance, the twist. Uh, this can increase pain and uh, suggest that there is damage to the meniscus. So now that we understand a little bit of the physical exam and presentation, looking at imaging of the meniscus, x-rays are unfortunately unlikely to demonstrate pathology unless outside of calcified menisci or possibly decreased joint space, which may be due to uh, cartilage loss or meniscal extrusion. MRI is the most sensitive, and it's best evaluated on T2 imaging. This extends to the joint, uh, excuse me, uh, criteria include extension of this signal uh, to the joint surface as seen in this panel here to the upper left. Additionally, we can see missing or attenuated meniscal tissue. There's also evidence of tears with perimeniscal cysts. There's also the uh, pathognomonic sign of the double PCL sign um, as seen here on this panel, which can represent a flipped piece of the meniscus imitating the PCL. There's also the meniscal ghost sign seen in the bottom left-hand panel here, uh, typically due to complete transection of the meniscus or meniscal root tear. And then there's extrusion of the meniscus, which is seen in the bottom right-hand panel here. So not all tears are created equal, and some are more difficult to treat than others. Uh, while some, characteristic, or some patterns are more characteristic in certain populations, uh, any tear pattern can be seen in any patient population and is more dependent on the mechanism of injury. Complex tears typically occur over time with repetitive microtrauma and are larger trauma, uh, excuse me, or large traumas that are not not treated and result in abnormal shearing forces along the different torn fibers of the meniscus. Radial tears are typically traumatic, uh, originating on the inner margin of the meniscus, as seen in the illustration here. Horizontal tears are between the superior and inferior surfaces and sometimes can elevate a flap of the meniscus. <clears throat> we also see vertical longitudinal tears. This is typically seen in the more active individuals with a traumatic injury. Um, and these can be um, also propagated to be the most extreme version of this, which is a bucket handle tear, which is often associated, mechanical, associated with mechanical blocks to motion. Another type of injury is the meniscal root tear. Seen here is the Labrad classification for meniscal root tears. They're, or, they're located within one centimeter of the root origin. Repair of these is critical to restoring the normal anatomy and function of the meniscus, as we described in the biomechanics of these structures. And suture fixation through transosseous tunnels allows the reduction of the root to its anatomic location so that it can then provide that shock, shock absorbing mechanism that we described earlier. We also see these injuries in association with other traumatic injuries. So it's well known that tibial plateau uh, fractures, particularly those that have depression, can be associated with uh, uh, meniscal tears and need to be identified and treated at the time of injury. And then when we see ACL tears, there's a classic lateral meniscus tear. Uh, we describe these as the lateral meniscus oblique radial tears, and they occur in, in approximately 12 to 15% of patients with ACL tears. More on the treatment of these later with Dr. Heinigan. So now to consider treatment algorithms and management considerations for uh, meniscal tears. So there are certain things to consider as we described earlier that the, not all tears are created equal. Uh, first, we have to consider the age and functional status of the patient and what are the goals of our treatment of, this, uh, of these injuries. We also have to consider the location of the tear and its healing potential as we described earlier with the vascular status of the areas of the meniscus. We also have to consider the quality of the tissue that we're working with and if it is amenable to repair. And then we also have to consider recovery time and goals of care. This is particularly important to think about when we uh, treat athletes who need to consider either returning in season um, versus receiving a repair, which may have a delayed return to sport. <clears throat> and then uh, a little bit more specific is the type of tear and its propensity to heal. So I mentioned briefly that radial tears uh, occur on the inner margin and may be more difficult to treat as such, and also in the orientation of those fibers and their injury. Here we have a diagram. Uh, it's a nice flow chart for how to consider management of meniscal tears. And first looking from the top down, the first 
the first branch point is wondering if there is also associated se severe degeneration of the knee, in which case it may be prudent to pursue physical therapy or maybe a total knee replacement if it's appropriate for the patient. If they're symptomatic, then you can consider arthroscopy. And then that's where we consider the different zones of injury of the meniscus. The red, red zone, uh, if these tears are reducible, meaning we can get them back into their anatomic location, then we can consider repair and would suggest that to be better for the patient. In the white, white zone, uh, typically we do not believe these will heal very well and uh, they are more amenable to meniscectomy. And the red, white zone, there's a, a number of factors that come into play, as we just uh, mentioned previously, which can weigh in on whether or not to re uh, attempt repair versus uh, meniscectomy. So in that algorithm, we mentioned non-surgical management, which typically looks uh, like rest, ice, compression, and elevation, similar to what we do in other orthopedic injuries. And this is mainly aimed at swelling management, as we know that pain is a large component of the symptoms of these uh, patients. Physical therapy is aimed at strengthening the dynamic stabilizers of the knee in order to help with that force transduction of, across the knee. And it's best for tears without mechanical symptoms or those that are not amenable to repair. non steroidal anti-inflammatories have their role as well. So I'm sure all the surgeons in this talk are sick of talking not about non-surgical management, so let's get right into surgery. Uh, first, looking at meniscectomy. So here in the upper left-hand panel of these arthroscopic images, we can see a tear of the meniscus. Um, with <clears throat> particularly low quality of the tissue with frayed edges, likely not amenable to repair in this um, white, white, or red, white zone. Um, and this was uh, trimmed back with a meniscectomy uh, to the bottom uh, uh, right hand image that you can see here. And this, while this might be right for some tears in some patients, this isn't necessarily right for everyone. So there are effects of the meniscectomy. So it allows, it does allow athletes or people to return back to their activities or sports quickly. Some studies suggest that folks can turn back to uh, return back to sport uh, up to even 54 days after meniscectomy. There were delayed presentations for non-elite or competitive athletes, but that still is on the order of about 90 days, which is sooner than what we would see for repair. But does this accelerate degeneration is always the question. And there have been several studies to illustrate this, but one that was particular for athletes um, took 147 athletes and found that four and a half years after meniscectomy, 40% of them had radiographic degeneration, and even thereafter, at 15 years, nearly 90% of them had degeneration. Um, and this would make sense with the biomechanics that we discussed earlier uh, across the knee and its force transduction and point loading of the cartilage uh, and its protective function uh, lost with meniscectomy. One landmark trial that was looking at meniscectomy versus physical therapy and a particular patient uh, population is the Meteor trial. So this was a multi-centered prospective randomized control trial that took adults that were 45 and older with meniscal tears and evidence of osteoarthritis and uh, sorted them into two groups and uh, that one treatment arm received physical therapy and the other received arthroscopic partial meniscectomy. There were no significant difference in pain and functional scores at 6 and 12 months uh, in these two arms, uh, but notably there was a crossover to surgery seen in approximately 30% of physical therapy group, but that also indicates that 70% of those folks uh, never crossed over into the surgery arm and uh, did just fine with physical therapy and avoided the risks of surgery. More towards the degeneration that occurs after uh, meniscal injury and or um, a meniscectomy, there has been found to be approximately 15% conversion rate to total knee arthroplasty at 20 years after meniscectomy. And the mean time between surgeries is seven years. So some may see that valuable is to keep patients symptomatic free or symptom free for seven years, and others may elect to uh, pursue the physical therapy that was previously mentioned. There were some predictors of conversion to total knee arthroplasty, which included uh, osteoarthritis at the time of surgery or associated chondral lesions. Lateral meniscectomies or malalignment also contributed to the risk for um, total knee arthroplasty. So now away from partial meniscectomies and in towards surgical management with repair, um, there are different types of repair of the meniscus. There's what's described as the inside-out repair, which is uh, the gold standard, uh, but this does increase operative time and uh, dissection in order to um, essentially uh, feed your uh, sutures from the inside out, as the name would imply. There is the outside in repair, and this can be particularly useful in situations where you cannot 
or orient your instruments or sutures in a way, uh, such as the anterior horn of the meniscus, uh, and surgery can be completed from an outside-in technique. And then there's uh, the all-inside repair, which is using uh, devices to um, uh, distribute sutures through the injured zone uh, within all within the knee without the need for external dissection. So how do these do? Uh, well, success of these repairs depend on many factors. So the tear location, as we mentioned before, um, the tissue quality and the patient age, and then concurrent injuries in their treatments. Um, studies have found that uh, meniscal tears that are treated at the same time as ACL tears um, uh, tend to heal better. And this may be due to uh, release of factors from the bone marrow due to uh, drilling of the tunnels at the time of surgery. And this can help to uh, augment the repair. Speaking of augmentative repairs, there are several different types of ways that have been posited for improving these um, these repair outcomes. Um, so the, the categories that we look at for biologic needs for healing are cell recruitment, so laying down new tissue, vascularization and getting the nutrients to the area that, that would be necessary for healing, matrix deposition to help orient these fibers, and then inflammation control. And Certain studies have looked at different arms of these uh, aspects of treatment or, excuse me, aspects of healing. Looking at cell recruitment, there was a study that looked at synovial stem cells um, and <clears throat> in injection locally into the area. And they found that in a basic science study that they were able to inject particular synovial stem cells into the area and have them lay down new uh, tissue over the injured zone. Uh, but the difficulty is getting these factors to stay in the correct area um, as uh, with different scaffolding or microspheres or uh, delivery systems. There's been another number of studies that look at uh, vascularization and trying to increase vascularization of these uh, injuries to the uh, red white zone or the white white zone, looking at cell surface markers that might indicate um, those areas that are more uh, vascular, including uh, CD34 and CD. 146. Uh, these are still in research to see if we can expand these uh, cell, these particular cell lines uh, to the more inner margins of the meniscus. And there are other factors that are being studied to help with matrix deposition and inflammation control within the knee to appropriately help healing. One option uh, that is is uh, that is used for significant loss of meniscus um, or patients that have injuries, injuries to the meniscus or a significant um, loss of the meniscus due to meniscectomy is meniscal allograft transplantation. It's indicated for these young patients and those without minimal, or the, excuse me, those with minimal cartilage loss at the time of injury. Um, survival of these is good at five to 10 years, um, approximately 70, it's 70 to 85%, um, but there is a graft failure rate of about 10 to 30% and more on this to follow. Mm -hmm. Um, while this is uh, sort of an extreme uh, treatment, this can be successful to help pr uh, protect against osteoarthritis in these populations. There's different techniques that can be used, uh, sutures versus bone blocks, um, seen here in the image of uh, uh, the upper image here. There are sutures to the periphery of the meniscus holding the uh, allograft in place. Um, there's others with bone blocks from the meniscal tibial roots and uh, inserting those in order to get the, the bone to bone healing. Uh, failure of these though can happen in many ways, extrusion of the meniscus, graft rejection or mechanical failure. And uh, these folks are followed quite closely. So in summary, the meniscus is required for normal biomechanic function, function of the knee and disruption of the meniscus leads to abnormal contact forces within the knee and can lead to accelerated arthritis. The treatment is both uh, tear and patient specific and consideration of goals and time to return to function and the expected outcome for these patients. Degenerative meniscus tears remain difficult to treat, though physical therapy may be a good option for these patients. And meniscal repair is the optimal treatment when able, and meniscal transplant is an option for active young patients. Thank you. Um, thanks again, JD, for that outstanding um, introduction to the meniscus, uh, and thank you all for joining us this morning. I'm, I'm really excited to to talk about this um, subject. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Mia Hagen. I'm an associate professor in our department, um, and I have a clinical interest in uh, hip and knee arthroscopy. Um, these are my disclosures, some of which are relevant to this talk. <clears throat> so I'll be picking up where JD left off um, in terms of 
um, you know, uh, our understanding of the meniscus um, and really um, discussing, you know, why, why there's this movement now to save the meniscus and how our understanding and management has changed. So why save the meniscus? Well, as JD said, um, these are complex anatomic structures, um, and they have a lot of important functions. Um, so specifically, um, we'll be focusing on you know load bearing and knee stability. So in terms of load bearing, um, we know that increased cartilage contact pressures occur after meniscectomy, um, and that this is relative to the amount that is resected. We also know this is especially true on the lateral side, where the meniscus covers more of the articular surface. As a result, we've seen that after meniscectomy, these knees do progress to osteoarthritis. Um, and so this is an example of a study from the Swedish registry of over 2,000 patients, comparing them to the general population following for 10 years. Um, as you can see on this uh, Kaplan-Meier uh, graph, that there is um, uh, increased progression to osteoarthritis you know, compared to control population. Um, and then, you know, looking at repair and then partial nasectomy. This is another longitudinal study of about 50 patients who were studied or followed for 40 years. Um, and so these patients underwent total meniscectomy at age 15 and is similar to um, this uh, uh, photo on the right. Um, and they found a 13.2% rate of total knee replacement within that 40 year follow up um, as compared to our age matched um, patients in their registry of 0.1%. You know, so you could look at this as you know 132 times greater. <clears throat> now focusing on knee stability, so we know um, that the meniscus plays an important role for stability as well. Um, this is particularly true for the medial meniscus. We've seen that you know if you remove even like 40 percent of the width of that meniscus, that you get significant increases in AP laxity with anterior tibial translation. Um, this is not a new concept. You know, studies from over 20 years ago um, on the ACL deficient knee really demonstrated this as well, where if you took out the medial meniscus, um, you had an increase in that anterior translation as well. This is a recent study from France demonstrating that the effect of um, meniscectomy can be similar to having an increased tibial slope. So, you know, this little cartilage structure, you know, really um, provides stability similar to, to bone in some, um, if you think about it that way. And finally, longitudinal data, data also shows that um, ACL survival is reduced in patients who have undergone meniscectomy as compared to an intact or repaired state. When we look at head-to-head -head comparisons of meniscectomy versus repair, we do see that meniscectomy is associated with a higher rate of osteoarthritis. Uh, in this meta-analysis of level two and three studies with midterm follow-up, although patients had uh, equivalent patient-reported outcomes and reoperation rates, um, there was an increased progression to advanced osteoarthritis, as seen by Kelk and Grant Lawrence grading, as well as a progression to total knee arthroplasty. So why are we still doing meniscectomies then? Well, um, a lot of reasons. Um, they're easy. They're low risk to the patient, small portals, low risk of infection. Um, they're quick and easy rehab for patients. Um, after a meniscectomy, a patient can return to sport in you know a month versus a uh, repair where you're waiting potentially six to eight months. Patients do improve, at least for the short term, and that makes patients happy. Um, and, and finally, sometimes it's all that we can do, especially if the quality of the tissue um, is not amenable to repair. So now um, progressing to how our understanding and management of the meniscus have changed. As JD nicely outlined, the meniscus has a very complex anatomy, and there are a lot of differences between the medial and the lateral meniscus. You can just see on this cadaveric diagram um, the difference of the coverage of the articular surface and the shape of these structures. In terms of the mobility of the lateral meniscus, you know, um, we know that it's a hypermobile structure. This cadaveric dissection shows you know, the subluxation of that meniscus posteriorly through knee flexion. Um, you know, here is an MRI study looking at a healthy knee in different um, states of flexion, and you can see on these sagittal cuts that posterior translation of the lateral meniscus really showing how hypermobile it is. How does this translate to our management? Um, on the medial meniscus, if we are faced with a bucket handle repair, we're going to put a lot of sutures into it, um, you know, sometimes six to eight inside out sutures on average, I would say, um, and sometimes even all inside anchors more posteriorly. On the lateral side, however, um, we don't need as much fixation because it's a more hypermobile structure. So here's a case example of a 30-year-old gentleman with a bad knee injury after skiing. Um, you can see he's got this uh, bucketed posterior horn of his lateral meniscus that we reduced. Um, and then I just put, you know, just a, a handful of sutures in, three or four, um, 
uh, to fix it. Um, and then, you know, went back later, six weeks later to, to fix the rest of his multi-leg injury. And that meniscus had fully healed um, had, and had good uh, mobility, uh, similar to its native state. <clears throat> so how, has our, how else has our understanding and management changed over time? Um, these are some things that I learned as a resident. Um, and, and these things are no no fault of the the people that taught me. This is just the you know the state of the art of of our understanding at the time. Um, and um, so things that I learned were like, for example, that we want to trim the leaflets on horizontal tears. So usually taking out the inferior flap of those when we're treating those. We also learned that because the white white zone doesn't have great vascularity, it can't heal. So parrot beak tears and central radial tears get trimmed. We also learned not to repair the meniscus in older patients because, again, there was a concern for healing rates um, as we age. And so even in vertical or bucket handle tears, we were doing meniscectomies. And then we were just starting to repair root tears, and no one was really sure if it was going to work. So this is a pixelated image of example of a horizontal uh, cleavage tear where, um, you know, uh, as is kind of standard, um, you know, even 10 years ago, we would just go in and trim the inferior flap of that um, in order to minimize symptoms that might be occurring from an associated paramenisical cyst. However, our data show us that taking out one of these leaflets actually increases the contact pressure of the cartilage um, 30 to 40%. So we know that that probably isn't that good. So now there's more of a movement to repair these. And so um, this like hay bale configuration is pretty popular now um, where you put sutures around um, the meniscus to bring those flaps together. Um, this study demonstrated uh, excellent return to sport and re low reoperation rates with that procedure. Here's a case example of a 17 year old gentleman with a soccer injury. You can see his uh, parrot beak tear on the MRI here, as well as his, uh, and that's what it looked like in the, in the pick in the uh, scope, and then you can see his uh, horizontal cleavage tear as well. Um, and so, you know, if I was in residency, this would have been treated with a straight up meniscectomy. And it said, we're going to try to repair it. So we first do, you know, a hashtag type configuration around the, the parrot beak tear itself um, and kind of wrap it in there and then bring uh, sutures around it circumferentially for a hay bale um, using outside in techniques to get the more anterior portions of the tear all the way around. This patient um, is doing well and is returning to soccer. Um, but what about the vascularity? You know, as, as we've all learned, the white, white zone doesn't seem to have blood vessels. So why, why would we try to heal it or repair it? Um, and I think there's emerging uh, evidence that there actually is vascularity and, and potential heal in this area of the meniscus. Um, so, you know, you have to do some special sequencing to see all this, but you can find um, MSCs as well as blood vessels in all three zones of the meniscus, and actually even a higher concentration of MSCs in some cases in the white-white zone. <clears throat> so this has really brought up this concept of maybe we need to do something to help these types of tears heal, uh, and, and, uh, and thus the concept of marrow venting has become a lot more popular in the last five years. Um, this came out of, um, you know, an understanding that when we do uh, meniscus repairs in conjunction with ACL reconstruction, we see much higher rates of healing of those repairs compared to isolated meniscus repairs. And so the thought is that all the blood that gets released from the bone tunnel drilling during ACL reconstruction may help promote the healing, kind of like natural PRP, I guess you could think about it that way. And so, um, so marrow venting is taking a microfracture awl or a drill and punching holes in the notch of the knee to stimulate bleeding. Um, and in this RCT, they show that marrow venting on second look arthroscopy resulted in a much higher re healing rate for large um, unstable tears. Um, similarly, um, we've looked. Um, people have looked at this compared to ACL reconstruction with meniscus repair and found that very similar survival rate, rates when you do this procedure. So I'd say that this is becoming more standardized in terms of our treatment of uh, isolated meniscus tears, particularly larger tears like bucket handle tears. And here's another example of showing that the white-white zone can still be repairable. Um, so this is one of our gymnasts who um, fell off the uneven bars and um, ripped her, her knee up. Um, so, you know, uh, on the lateral side of meniscus, um, you can see she's got this uh, parrot beak tear, but then she also had a separate area of that meniscus posteriorly that had a radial tear um, with extrusion of the meniscus. Um, so I went in there um, and uh, she also you know, had a patellar tendon injury at the same time. So we acutely uh, went to surgery, fixed her um, meniscus tears in both locations. 
Um, and then, you know, three months later, staged the rest of her multi-leg um, and found complete healing of this tear. And I thought what was really impressive about this case was um, if you see that there on the, the image on the bottom left, um, I did like a, just a tiny little actual trim of that white white where I couldn't bring those leaflets together adequately. And I was impressed to see that that actually kind of regrew at um, second look scope three months later. <clears throat> so how about older patients? Um, is repair still a good idea in patients over 40? Um, and our, you know, the, be the best evidence we have is that this can work. Um, so this was a meta-analysis looking at repair in patients over 40 versus patients under 40 and finally found no difference in failure or reoperation rates. So I think the key here is to just, um, you know, not so much look at the age of the patient, but the quality of the tissue um, to make a decision of whether or not repair is possible. As you know, certainly some some tears are just not amenable to repair as they won't hold sutures. But if you've got you're faced with good quality tissue, even in an older patient um, uh, with good cartilage uh, repair, I think is a very reasonable option. Uh, let's take a second to, to talk about these radial and root tears, which, uh, as uh, JD showed us, were, were they're a really huge deal. Um, so with these types of tears, you get a loss of the hoop stresses, um, and then the meniscus can extrude. This then in, uh, results in increased tibial femoral contact forces and progression to arthritis. Um, so we really want to try to repair these types of tears, especially if there's no osteoarthritis. Uh, the study um, demonstrated the, the effect of these tears on the car contact pressures. So, you know, looking at this image, um, picture three is the state of the contact pressure with the root tear. And picture four is the state without a meniscus at all. So you can see how those are really quite similar um, versus picture two, um, which is the state of the repaired root. Uh, and here's a cadaveric dissection demonstrating this, um, you know, the extrusion that can occur with a with a root tear as compared to the intact state. Um, case example of a root tear progression. Uh, this is not my patient, but uh, but I've had patients similar to this. Um, you can just see the progressive collapse of the joint space in in under a year. Um, and there are uh, longitudinal studies uh, showing that. Um, you know, there are high rates of conversion of these types of meniscus tears to total knee arthroplasty at two and a half years because these can be just so symptomatic. <clears throat> but the, you know, the question is, can these repair of these root tears actually heal? Um, a lot of the data on this comes from Asia, um, where, they, where they've been doing these types of repairs a little bit longer than we have. Um, so in this study, uh, 71 patients with two-year follow-up, uh, they did a second look scope on 33 of those patients due to symptoms um, and found that actually 70% of those had healed. Um, and so you can see um, picture uh, B is like what they call the healed tear versus picture D, um, which they called a failed uh, repair. Um, and, and obviously those patients who had a healed meniscus had better patient reported outcomes and less radiographic joint space narrowing. Importantly, there were some predictors of failure with these repairs, um, notably elevated BMI and presence of a grade three or four chondral defect at the time of surgery. Um, and these are these predictors of failure are a really big deal because these tears typically happen in patients who are overweight um, and who may have chondral defects at the time of their MRI, found at the time of their MRI. Um, kind of classic presentation of this type of injury is uh, an overweight um, woman in her like 50s who just kind of twists coming down a step and then feels a big pop in the back of her knee. Um, and then, you know, um, may not seek care initially or, or may not get an MRI initially, but then by the time advanced imaging is obtained, um, you can see uh, evidence of chondral degeneration. Um, and it may be too late. <clears throat> In terms of root repair outcomes, um, you know, looking at repair versus metastectomy, we see significantly lower rates of progression to osteoarthritis and uh, total knee conversion. Um, in patients who undergo repair. And, 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 and this makes sense because really a meniscectomy is, is kind of like doing nothing for a root tear, if you think about it, since the root tear itself is like not having a meniscus. So uh, I think it really calls into question, um, you know, meniscectomy as a treatment for root tears. Um, and I would argue that probably shouldn't be done. <laughs> So how can we improve the healing rates of these types of tears? I, I would really like to, to know that you know myself, as, as these are really tricky injuries. Um, this is a, a case example of a 50-year-old physical therapist of mine who, um, she was overweight um, and had this injury about six months prior, tried, you know, doing some non-operative management, but had continued symptoms and wanted surgery. So, you know, at the time of surgery, you can see really the chronicity of this injury with these kind of um, like rolled over edges at the tear itself. Um, and then you can also see the extrusion of the meniscus 
Um, so we did our best with the repair, putting several sutures in the root through a transosseous tunnel, and then also backing it out with um, all inside suture anchors. Um, and, you know, left the OR feeling pretty good about the reduction that we got on the meniscus. Um, but, you know, just following her over time, it's like, you know, um, following your patient out, you can, you can see that this is kind of what happens. And, um, you know, she has progressed. She, she does have symptoms currently from this and, you know, it is un an unfortunate. Um, and so what can, what can we really do to help healing of these tears? Um, you know, kind of focusing on two main things, getting an anatomic repair and using centralization sutures. Um, and then uh, we'll pause on augmentation since we already discussed marrow venting. In terms of obtaining an anatomic repair, we know that um, from uh, biomechanical studies that if you take the anatomic location and just translate it slightly, um, you get a much higher uh, uh, contact pressures of the knee similar to just the torn state. So putting the tunnel in the right spot seems to matter. Um, but even if you get it in the right spot, these repairs can still loosen over time. So this is just looking at the sutures themselves and, and they pull out from the meniscus. And with increasing cyclical loading, you do see um, displacement. So not just getting an anatomic repair, but perhaps there are things that we can do to back up these structures. Um, centralization is a, a newer concept that's getting becoming really popular the last few years. Um, and uh, this is kind of using the meniscotibial ligament um, to assist with um, inhibiting extrusion. Um, this was first described in 2012 in Japan. Um, and the idea was that they saw that you know increased meniscal extrusion was an independent predictor of cartilage loss. And so they did some uh, animal studies showing that if they put these uh, centralization sutures in along the body um, and anchored them into the plateau that they could minimize this extrusion. But we really um, don't really know the, the results of this in, in live patients, um, and, and especially in the lateral meniscus, which I've shown has um, increased hypermobility, um, if, it's a, if it's something we should be doing. Nonetheless, here's an example of centralization. So this is a 16-year-old high school football player. You can see on his MRI his root tear as well as his extrusion. Uh, there's his ghost sign, as JD had mentioned. And so arthroscopically, this is what that acute tear looks like. And you can see the disruption of the medial uh, tibial ligament, uh, meniscal tibial ligament. And then so we put some anchors in. And, and you can do this via anchors or via bone, bone tunnels. Um, I've kind of changed my technique more to bone tunnels recently. Um, but passing the sutures along and then also doing transosseous tunnel for the root itself to pull it over into the bone. And then that's what it looks like when it's uh, repaired. Um, we can also do this open. This is another case of a multi-leg with a, with a bad root tear. So again, you see the extrusion. Um, so here, because we had to open up the medial side anyways to address the MCL uh, and the capsule, um, we just put the anchors in via an open technique. Um, and both of those patients did really well and, and, and were able to return to sport around Around a, re around a year. Similarly for radial tears, if there's extrusion, there's a thought of adding centralization to help support those um, as this picture shows. Here, on the lateral side, we treat this a little bit differently though, again, because of the hypermobility. Um, so here's an example of a, a complete radial tear in a high level gymnast. You can see the extrusion as well as the, the gapping at the area of the popliteal hiatus. And this is what it looked like arthroscopically. Um, so here we're doing side-to-side -side repair of this in order to, again, preserve that mobility rather than anchoring it to the capsule. And then I just did a, a single suture um, for stabilization um, in the area right next to the popliteus. Um, but you can see the meniscus still has a great amount of uh, mobility with, uh, with uh, motion of the knee. Very briefly, um, some special meniscus tears. Um, these are things that we're gonna see a lot more in information on, I think in the next decade. Um, but two tears have, have come up in association with ACL injuries that are um, of interest. Um, the first is the Lamort or the lateral meniscus oblique radial tear. Um, and um, there's really not a lot of data on this yet to drive you know, decision-making. Um, but what we've seen on biomechanical studies is that leaving these tears untreated can result in increased anterior translation and increased pivoting, as well as meniscal extrusion. And this might be a reason why some of our ACL reconstructions show um, high rates of post-traumatic osteoarthritis in the lateral compartment um, when these tears are left untreated. Secondly, the ramp tear. Um, so this is a tear at the back of the medial meniscus. Um, and um, you know may not look like much when you look at it initially arthroscopically, but then as you look in the posterior region, you can see the vertical um, tear of that meniscus. And on the MRI, sometimes your only clue is just bone edema of the, of the tibial plateau. 
Um, so here's another example of video of looking at a, a different patient of mine um, where you um, can see that um, initially, if you don't probe it, you don't know that it's there. And then when you, you know, put the camera in the back, it's a little bit more obvious, um, the tear. So repair this just like we do would do any um, longitudinal uh, vertical tear, um, and, um, and the patient uh, did well. Um, here's another example of a repair technique. If you can't do it through the front, you can go through the back and do uh, use a suture passing device. Our biomechanical data suggests that these tears are, uh, are bad players in terms of increasing laxity of the knee, um, and that can cause increased strain on your graft. In fact, they're often found at the time of revision ACL, so it's a bit of a chicken or egg situation there, I think. Um, but again, clinical outcome studies are lacking. And, and finally, just wanted to wrap things up with, you know, letting, letting people know that it is still okay to leave some meniscus tears alone, though. We don't have to be treating all of these. Um, this is a nice longitudinal study of uh, with six-year follow-up from the Moon cohort. And of 210 patients with meniscus tears left in situ, they had only a 2, two to 4% reoperation rate on those, um, with predictors of uh, reoperation being a medial tear, a larger tear, or a younger patient. So if you have like a small lateral meniscus tear, you know, it's, it may be okay just to leave that alone. And in the interest of time, we're, we're, I decided not to discuss transplantation too much today. And, and, it's, and it's really because the data is not really there yet to, I think, back up this um, procedure. Um, although it is, you know, one of my more favorite operations. So saving the meniscus is a hot topic in sports medicine. We know that meniscectomy has suboptimal long-term performance and newer repair techniques do so some biomechanical promise. Um, promise, although there's a lot of industry bias in those studies. So we really need higher quality data to drive our decision making. And that's the bottom line with the meniscus. These are really technically challenging procedures. And so before we can really move the needle um, and make them more popular, we need to show that they demonstrate both cost effectiveness and improve patient quality of life. Thank you very much. Mia, JD. Really great talks. Uh, thank you for uh, for those presentations. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, looks like there's one here in the chat. I don't know. Uh, it's Brad. I, I me. I have, yeah. Go ahead, Brad. It's Brad Henley. I, I put in the chat. Although you mentioned allograft meniscal transplantation, can you mention the emerging technology of meniscal replacement with synthetic meniscal implants? Where do you think that's going to go? I think one of them's out there called New Surface. Yeah, I haven't uh, honestly paid too much attention to those um, uh, because I, I'm a little always a little bit skeptical of new technology. But um, I I know that they were first kind of shown over in Europe, and I think there were some studies there, and I just got approved in the in the U.S. as well. Um, I I think we'll really have to see, um, you know. One big problem that we have with like meniscus transplants, for example, is extrusion. Um, and I, I can't imagine that that would be much different for these types of um, implants as well. Um, and probably even uh, potentially more so if they're they're synthetic. But I, I, I think, you know, we'll, we'll we'll certainly see more about that and and obviously um, uh, see if it can do something to, to change, um, you know, the outcomes of these patients. But I myself don't have any experience, you know, using those um, and haven't really looked into the newer data. Thanks. I do have a second question, but I'll let Will go first. Oh, I was just, you know, I found it really interesting um, when you're presenting the information about the healing potential of different zones and, and how maybe our, our dogma has been, been challenged. How do you, do you, this is a, probably a hard question, but do you, see areas where we have you know established dogma that we don't have a lot of evidence in where you think there might be specific areas that we could where we'll have these new findings like are there things we don't that we kind of assume are true that we base our techniques on and meniscus management or in sports medicine that you think there are big opportunities to to investigate and i know that's a hard question like what do we don't what don't we know mm -hmm. uh, or maybe the question is just do you think there's a lot of opportunities like that because that was that was really interesting to hear in the talk. Yeah, um, something that was that I, I hesitated to put in my talk, but that that has been on my mind is really our um, how can we make meniscectomy potentially a better procedure for patients? And um, you know, we know that. So maybe I'm not directly answering your question, but we know that like with um, 
meniscectomy, we're increasing the contact pressures and that can be bad for the natural history of the knee. Um, so perhaps in some of these like patients that are like in their thirties or forties who are get, who just have a non-repairable meniscus tear, um, you know, perhaps we should be considering, you know, like the effect of osteotomy on those patients. And, um, and, and I'm, you know, this is um, of interest in, in knee preservation. And I think we're going to see more data um, kind of going back to osteotomy as being potentially a very powerful protective procedure. Um, but obviously, you know, we need more case numbers and more better longitudinal data for that. So that, that's one thing is like, how can we just make meniscectomy better? Um, the other, uh, in terms of like long-term follow-up, and then the other thing I think is is really this concept of extrusion. I, I'm really excited about it, but we we just don't have the data yet to uh, the clinical data yet to back up the the scientific data there. Um, but I think it can be a way that can really enhance because we know that root repairs can heal. Um, we've seen you know evidence of that, and, and but sometimes the problem is just the tissue is like not great at the root itself, and it the sutures just rip out before the healing can happen. So I think the the idea of the extrusion is doing something else to help support that rip, that uh, root um, to give it more time to, to heal before the sutures fail. Um, so I think those are potentially two, two things, but. Thanks. Um, Dr. Schmelly. Yeah, hey, Mia. great presentation. Great job, JD. I, I was intrigued by the repairs that you did of the flap tears and the radial tears, and then the second looks that showed they'd healed. I, I'm I'm feeling guilty sitting here of the radial tears I've been trimming, and I wonder how how much of of the meniscus in terms of like uh, a percentage thickness are you thinking? Oh no, now I should be repairing that. I shouldn't trim it. What, how do you yeah. set your margin? Um, based on biomechanical data, any tear that's greater than sixty percent of the width of a radial tear should probably be repaired because that is almost like um, like a seventy percent increase in contact pressure, particularly on the lateral side. Um, so, um, but I think in a young patient, they have such good healing potential that you could make an argument to do a radial, uh, repair for even a much smaller tear than that. Um, so, um, and the, and one way that I think about it is, you know, in a, in especially someone who's under 20, if you think of how many years they have on their knee, even if there is like potentially a 20% reoperation rate, if it fails, that means that maybe there's an 80% chance that thing's going to heal. Right. And then you've really done something to change the natural history of that knee over time. Yeah. Yeah. Those are my patients. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Henley. Yeah. Second question I put in the chat too, but you know, with trauma, or traumatic uh, tibial plateau fractures, we often encounter complete detachment and with displacement of the lateral meniscus, with or without some tears. And given the natural increased mobility of the lateral meniscus, do you have any recommendations for the ideal manner to repair that peripheral detachment? For example, how many sutures and perhaps where should they be placed and more specifically, where shouldn't they be placed at the meniscal capsular junction? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to preface this by saying I don't think we have great data to to tell us one way or another yet, and you know, um, uh, and I certainly don't want to be telling our experts at Harborview what to do. Um, but I, but I think uh, overall we know that the lateral meniscus is a hypermobile structure, a, and then b, we also know that when there's blood in the knee, things heal. So I think that the number of sutures that you might want to do on a lateral meniscus could probably be min like just a, a hand, like a few, right? To to really feel like it'll stay where it needs to be. And especially if you've got good articular um, congruity uh, in your reduction of the fracture. Um, the medial side might need a little more support to minimize extrusion, um, just as we, we could we know the, the MTL has a really high um, uh, important function for stability for that medial meniscus. Um, but at least for the lateral side, you know, I think um, if the root is intact, um, probably just two or three sutures along the body and just not not securing anything in the popliteal hiatus uh, for sure. Well, I really appreciate that because obviously I was putting too many in that. And although I tried to leave the popliteal hiatus free, I'm sure I put closer to four to six around the you know anterior and lateral portion. So that's uh, good to know. Thanks so much. And if it fails, you just send it to us. <laughs> we can scope it. <laughs> Any additional questions? Yeah, Mia, the, great talk. Uh, super difficult problem in sports medicine. And honestly, like uh, something that I think if you kind of 
and maybe things are changing, but the way that meniscectomy was so ubiquitous in our world and in the general population for such a long time that patients come and are kind of, um, I don't know, casual about meniscus surgery when actually, you know, things like ACL uh, injuries are probably more surmountable in our world than actual bad meniscus tears. So it's like, oh man, I tore my ACL, but it's actually the meniscus that might be more of the concern depending on how the tear is. So I think super important that we're talking about it more and thinking about new ways like Will was suggesting to try to uh, address this kind of really important structure um, in the knee uh, that I think, like I said, historically, since we were more casual about how we treated it and treated it often with meniscectomy, I think everybody thought it was, it was something that we didn't have to worry about too much, but yes, it, kind of the harder problem that I face with every patient that I see, especially super young patients. Sorry, I guess that wasn't really a question, but I agree. Yeah, yeah. Good talk. And any, do we have any other? I don't have my uh, phone. I sometimes patient, uh, people text with questions. I don't see any texts from anybody with questions. So, no other questions from the audience? I have one. Um, oh, far away. Uh, my, my question is on, on uh, for example, root repairs. Uh, are you able to get load reduction during the healing period? And, and how do you accomplish that? And how important is it? Um, so I'm, I may be misinterpreting the question, but um, as you, so you can clarify, but I um, some techniques that have been used to like minimize like the load on that uh, repair um, are, you know, pie cresting the MCL. Um, it's been shown that that can improve uh, potentially the, the, the success of that operation. Um, um, so pie cresting is just when you take a needle and you release the, the deep MCL with that needle. Um, and what that's actually been, um, what, it's important because it helps open up the compartment so you can see what you're doing better, but, but also patients seem to have better outcomes with that. Um, and then the, the second technique I would say is to reduce that load on that is, is that, that concept of centralization, um, which on the medial side, for sure, you want to, um, consider doing, um, on the lateral side, uh, perhaps, perhaps not, um. And then just at time zero, we know that those root repairs do um, show um, that the load on those cartilage is reduced. And we've got good data showing that. On that okay. Do, do you use uh, partial weight bearing and for how long? Um, so for, for my protocol for um, meniscus root is initial um, non-weight bearing and then progressing to partial weight bearing with the idea of um, beginning uh, to wean crutches at one month. Um, based off of like, you know, the, the biology of, of how these things tend to heal over time. But I would say that we rehab is a thing that we have that we really don't understand in sports medicine. We have all these rules and regulations for patients to follow, and, and we don't really have a lot of data to, to back up any of that. Um, so and, and also, you know, you're dealing with patient compliance as well. Um, so, so I don't know, but my preference is to keep them off of it if I can. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Hagen, it's Ken Shin. I have a question that's kind of, uh, I guess, twofold. I guess one, one's more of a comment, the other is a question. The, um, so regarding the last question about protected weight bearing after um, meniscus repair, I, I tend to go slower on the radial or root repairs. So I, I make them strict non-weight bearing for four weeks and then adding 40 pounds of weight bearing each week as opposed to uh, like a bucket handle repair. It's, um, it's four weeks of toe touch weight bearing. So I go a little bit slower on the weight bearing. And then the, the question I have is, if we know that these meniscus root tears or root repairs stretch out a little bit over time, should we be over-tensioning them a little bit, assuming that it will stretch out? I Yeah, interesting idea. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the idea of like customizing the rehab plan to the surgery you're doing is um, totally uh, understand that. And um, and again, like I said, I don't think we have a lot of data telling us one way or another what to do. Um, the um, the I, over-tensioning, th I, I, the only response I would have to that is that we know that it needs to be anatomic. Um, the biomic time zero studies of, of when your repair is not anatomic show that the, the meniscus is not functioning appropriately to protect the cartilage. Um, so, uh, and, and the other thing that's important for them that we've shown is that you need to scrape that cartilage off and have actually a bony 
like bed of, of bleeding bone to repair it to. Um, you can't just like expect it to re repair it to, to cartilage itself. Um, so, um, so I think that kind of limits in how much you can pull it over um, in terms of the, the repair itself, you know, cause you got to put it in the anatomic spot. Um, but I suppose you could choke your sutures up higher on the meniscus to give full, like less more tissue for it to withstand the pull out. Yeah, I was thinking maybe dunk it into the tunnel a little bit more, but yeah, that's tough to do. I don't know, mm -hmm. just a thought. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. G, should we call it? Yeah, I think so. Uh, Dr. Hagen, Dr. Gatto, thank you guys for your presentation this morning. That was a great presentation, very stimulating discussion. Um, obviously, super important structure that we have to try to figure out how to be better about taken care of. So thank you for bringing all of that um, kind of up, uh, all of us up to date. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks everybody for joining.